In this video, you'll learn how to build a Linktree clone without writing a single line of code using a tool called Bubble. Before I say another word though, let's dive in and take a look at what we're going to be building today. In a preview of my app here, the first thing we're going to do is register a new account. So I'm going to jump ahead and add in the details of my own user profile here. From here, I'm then going to choose to register an account in which I'll then be redirected through to my homepage here, where as you can see, I've started customizing my own Linktree profile. And after adding a series of links here, I'm able to make changes to the title of this link on my page, as well as the destination URL for this particular link. I can also choose to upload a custom thumbnail image into this link. I can view how many clicks this link has received. And if I really wanted, I could also rearrange the order of these links on my profile, which you'll see will be updated in real time here. Then over in a settings page, because I've updated to a Linktree premium account, I also have the ability to update the background color of my profile. So I can choose to update this color to whatever I'd like, and then I can save those details to my account. Then over on my profile page here, I'll see a list of all of the links I've added onto my profile, which of course, if I was to click through to one of these links here, it's gonna redirect me through to my destination URL. And the last thing I should point out is that our application is gonna be fully responsive today across both desktop and mobile devices. So regardless of the user's device, they're gonna have a smooth, intuitive experience. If you wanna build your own app or startup but don't know how to code, you are in the right place. When it comes to no-code tools, Bubble is by far my favorite as it includes everything you need within one single platform. Not only does it give you the ability to create your own custom database, but it allows you to design the interface of your app, as well as create workflows to stitch everything together. And then finally, the ability to integrate with third-party tools and services. Each of those individual features would be a standalone no-code product. So Bubble includes all of this in one ready-to-go solution. Damn! Now, for those of you who don't know me, I previously worked with the Bubble team to write their How to Build blog series. This series took a list of the top products out there on the market, like Airbnb, Uber, and Instagram, and explained the step-by-step -step process to rebuilding these apps with Bubble's tool. Now, while these articles helped thousands of bubblers across the world, if you're anything like me, I personally prefer to learn through a video, as it allows you to just easily follow along a set of instructions. Now, of course, I would just like to point out that this tutorial has no affiliation with Bubble, and it's something that I'm doing in my own time. I feel like at this point I've said enough though, so let's just grab our Bubble editor, and I can start walking you through the process. Within our tutorial today, the very first thing I'm gonna cover is not actually going to be a user-facing features that people will interact with within our Linktree product. Instead, I just wanted to take the time to explain how we could set up the necessary data types and fields to power the rest of our Linktree clone. And now throughout our tutorial today, I'm gonna to be referencing this doc that I've created, which is just a checklist within Notion. And now the reason I use a Notion checklist while I'm creating a product within Bubble is that I just like to keep a to-do list or checklist of all of the items I'll be adding into my database, as well as a list of all of the features I'm gonna include throughout the tutorial. And what I love about Notion is that it allows you to just check these off as you work your way throughout the build, just so you can keep tabs on where you are throughout the overall project. And now when it comes to building out our database, I've got our necessary data types and fields listed out here. But before I run through all of these and explain everything in more detail, what I'd just like to do is open up a brand new bubble editor here. So at this point, I've just created a new bubble application and I haven't made any changes to it. The first thing I'm gonna do is head over to my data tab, which is just below my little screen recorder here. And what you'll notice within your data tab is that you have two separate sections of this page. On the left hand side, Bubble will display all of your data types, whereas on the right hand side, it's going to display all of your data fields. And by default, what you'll actually see is that Bubble has already created a user data type for us. So we don't need to actually build that in, it comes standard. And now a data type is essentially an overall entity that will be created within your application. 
So when I approach building out any custom database, I like to think or even write down a list of all of the things that users will need to create within our application. So for example, if a user wanted to register an account, they would be creating a new user entry in our database because they're going to be registering themselves. And then similarly within our Linktree clone, I also have a data type which is referred to as a link because a user will need to create a custom link that they can of course link out to within their profile. And so just a little pro tip when it comes to creating a database is, as I mentioned, try and think about what things users are going to need to create within your application. And in 99% of cases, they are going to be your overarching data types. And then within each data type, you have what's referred to as your data fields. So this is the list on the right here. And now data fields, as the name would suggest, allow you to store any additional data or information about each individual data type. So for every single user account, remembering that our user is our data type, we'd like to store some information about this user. So things like their email, their password, maybe a name or a username. And so all of those individual information points would be what's called a data field. And what you'll see is that by default, Bubble has also provided you with a list of data fields within our user data type. So it comes standard with an email data field, so you won't need to create this. And the reason it has this is because in Bubble, whenever you register someone's account, you'll need to store an email address for that user. It also does come with a password field, but it just doesn't display that in a plain text for security reasons. And so what I'd like to do today is add in all of our additional data fields into our user data type. But before that, I do just want to point out one particular thing. Next to our user data type here, you may notice there is some text that just states that there's privacy rules applied to this data type. If we were to click on this, it's going to open up our privacy tab within our editor here. And what you'll see is that by default, Bubble applies a privacy rule, which only allows people to see the data that they create within your application. So let's say you as a user register a Linktree account and you want to create a Linktree profile. If you were to go ahead and create a series of links that you want to display on that profile, you are the only person who will be able to view those links, not anyone else. And now that's not the experience we want to create today. Instead, we want to create an experience where anyone can view the links on your profile. So this privacy rule isn't so much applicable. So what we're going to do is actually choose to delete this privacy rule here. And now what you'll see back in our data tab here is that this user data type is publicly visible, which means that everyone can see the information that they have created. And now before we go and build out all of the data fields under a user, the first thing we'll need to do is add in all of our data types. And the reason I do that is because sometimes our data fields will actually need to link to a data type. And I'll be explaining how that happens in a moment. But within my Notion doc here, you'll see that I only have two data types. This is probably actually one of the smaller databases I've ever created within Bubble. So it's a relatively straightforward process to walk through. But essentially, I just have our user data type, which of course is going to allow someone to register an account. And then I have our link data type, which is going to store some information about a particular link that someone would like to create and display on their profile. And so what I'm going to do is jump back into Bubble and I'm just going to create a new data type called a link. And now from here, I can start to build out all of the necessary data fields within our data types. So what I'm going to do is actually start by building out all of the user data fields under our user data type. So for a user's account, I'd like to register things like their name, their bio, their username, and even a profile photo. I'll explain these as I add them into our Bubble editor. So I'm just going to jump over into our editor here, open up our user data type, and I'm going to create a new field here. And I'm going to be calling this field the name. And now as this would suggest, this is where I'm going to be storing the name of a person. And now when you create a new data field, you'll need to just identify what type of content you'd like to store for this particular field. So this is just going to determine what particular value this will be. And in this case, I want our name to just be a plain text field because we're just going to be storing someone's name written as letters. I'll choose to create this. Then I'd like to create a data field to store a user's bio. I'll also set this to be just a plain text field. I'll create that. 
Then I'd like to create another field, which is just going to be called someone's username. So this is going to be someone's unique ID when they create a Linktree profile. And in fact, the username is what we're going to store when we display someone's URL for their profile. So if, for instance, I had a custom domain, which was linktree.com, when someone views another user's profile, I'd like the URL of that person's profile to be linktree.com slash profile, which is the page they would be viewing. And then I'd have another slash followed by the person's unique username. And that would then allow me to display all of the details of that specific person on the page. But I won't overwhelm you with details at this point in time. Of course, I'll be sure to explain that in full detail when I get around to that process. But when it comes to this field here, I'm going to set this type to be another text field type just because a username will just be a string of characters. So I'm going to choose to create that. Then I'd also like to create an additional field, which is going to be called the profile photo. And this field type will need to be an image because I'll allow someone to upload a photo into this. I'll choose to create this. And now within our Linktree clone today, I'd also like to later on build out a feature that's going to allow users to upgrade their account to be a premium Linktree account. And if they do choose to pay to upgrade, I'd like to allow them to then update the background color as well as the text color on their profile. But in order to determine if a user should be a premium member or not, I'm going to need to create a new data field here. And I'm going to call this is premium. And if I set this field type to be a yes, no value, I'll be able to determine if the user is in fact a premium user or if they're not a premium user. I'll choose to create this. And after creating this, what I'm actually going to do is set a default value on this field, which just means that whenever someone signs up an account, by default, it's going to have a set value. And I'm going to set that value to be no, because by default, I don't want people to be a premium user. They're only going to be a premium user when they pay to upgrade. And of course, when they do process a payment later on, we'll be updating someone's value to be yes. But I'll explain that when we get there. The other thing I'd like to store for this user is a way to determine what custom theme color they would like for their Linktree profile. So let's say someone does pay to become a premium user and they want to update the background color as well as the font text color on their profile. I'm going to need to create a way to store the value of which color they want to display on their profile. So that way I can show it off later on. And so I'm going to create a new field here and I'll be calling this field theme background color. And as the name would suggest, this is where I'm going to store someone's unique color code that they would like to determine what background color their profile will display. And with this field type, because I'm just going to be storing a color code value, I'm just going to set this field type to be a text value because I'll be storing a string of characters. I'll choose to create this. And then I'm going to create an additional field, which will just allow me to store the value of the text font color that they want to save on their profile. And so I'm going to create another field here and I'm going to call this theme text color. I'll just need to add my dash in there. And just a personal preference of mine is that when I'm creating data fields, I like to just add dashes between each word. And the reason I do this is because when I reference a data field within my bubble editor later on, I'll easily be able to determine what is a data field because it won't have any spaces. It'll just have dashes. But for this field type, I'm just going to set this to be a text type. Once again, I'll choose to create that. And that's everything we'll need to add into our user data type. It's relatively straightforward. So what we'll do is we'll jump back into my notion checklist here and I will tick off this list. Of course, if you'd also like to follow along with your own notion checklist, I'll be sure to include a link in the description of this video that you can make a duplicate of this exact template. But from here, what I want to do is now move along and build out all of the data fields within my link data type. So every single time a user creates a link, I'm going to want to store some information about it. And if I jump into my bubble editor, I'm going to open up my link data type here. And for the very first field I'd like to create, I'm going to call this the title field. And as the name would suggest, this is going to be where someone can store the actual name that's going to display for this link on their profile. So if someone was to, let's say, drop a new line of merchandise, they could say something like my new spring merch drop. 
and that would be the title of the link that displays on their profile. I'll create this. Then of course, for every link, I'm also gonna need to determine a URL, which I'll be redirecting someone through to when they click on that. So I'm gonna create a new field and I'll call this URL. And this field type will just be a text field type. So let's say if someone wants to send a user through to their Instagram profile, the URL would just be something like www.instagram.com forward slash their handle. I'll choose to create this here. And then for every link, I'd also like to create a field that just allows a user to upload a custom thumbnail image for this link. So I'm gonna type in the words thumbnail image, and this will just be an image field type because I'm gonna allow someone to upload a photo that's going to display next to this link. I'll choose to create this. And then finally, as we work our way through the last two fields, I want to create another field here, which is just going to recognize the number of clicks that a link has received. So within our application today, every single time someone's link is clicked, I'm gonna be able to track how many clicks that has received, and I can display that data to the user. And for this field type, because I'm gonna be performing a count on how many clicks a particular link has received, I'm gonna set this field type to be a number, and that will allow me to keep tabs on how many clicks it has in fact received. I'll choose to create this. And then finally, the very last field I'd like to add is going to be called the position number. So in short, this field is just going to determine the order in which links should be displayed on someone's profile. So if a link has position number one, it's gonna be the top link on their profile. If a link is position number two, it's gonna be the second link. If it's position number 10, it's gonna be the 10th link. And later on in our build today, I'm gonna to explain how users can drag and drop to rearrange the order of their links. But for the time being, we're just gonna to need to create a position number field on each link so we can determine where it's gonna sit on a user's profile. And for this field type, I want it to be a number because as I mentioned, a link will be position number one, two, three, four, and so on. I'll then choose to create this here. And that is all of the data fields I need to add into my overall link data type. As I mentioned, it's a relatively straightforward process. And so if we were to jump back into my Notion checklist, I'm just going to tick off all of those data fields there. And that actually concludes the process of building out our database. As I mentioned earlier on, this was by far one of the easier databases I've had to build out for any tutorials. And that's because there's not too many overall data types and each data type has a relatively small number of data fields. But as you can see, it's never been easier to create your own custom database entirely out of no code using Bubbles platform. Now that we've finished building out our database, we can move along to the list of features that I have set out for us in our tutorial today. And as you can see, there's quite a number of different features that I wanna cover within our Linktree build. But one of the first features I wanted to walk us through was just creating a way for users to be able to register a new account. So obviously in order for someone to be able to use our platform, we're gonna want them to sign up an account first within our database. And thankfully, this is actually a relatively straightforward process to build out. So what we're gonna do is just jump over into our bubble editor here, and we're gonna to want to create a brand new page from scratch. And today we'll be building this page based on the example of the real world Linktree registration page. So on the right hand side of the page, you can see there's a featured image. And then on the left hand side, there's all of the relevant input fields, which will prompt a user to store the information they want within their account. And we're gonna recreate this whole experience here. So within our bubble editor, what we're gonna do is create a brand new page from scratch. So I'm gonna open up my page dropdown menu in the top left hand corner here. I'll select to add a new page and I'll just be calling this the register page. I'll choose to create this. And now the first thing I like to do whenever I create a page is not go ahead and add any of the elements on it, but instead I just personally like to update the background color of the page. And the reason I do that is because as you can see at this point in time, we can't actually really tell where our page lies unless we were to hover over it. So what I like to do is double click on the page and open up the property editor here. I then like to scroll on down to the background color and I'm just gonna update this to be a very faint shade of gray. So that way I can now actually see the outline of it within my bubble editor. And then before I add any elements onto my page, I'm gonna need to head over to the layout tab within our property editor. 
because I'll need to identify what container layout style I would like to add for this page. And now if you're relatively new to Bubble, the container layout just determines in which order your elements will be placed on this page. And by elements, I mean things like being able to add text, buttons, images, and everything else in between. And when it comes to the container layout options, if we were to open up this drop down menu here, you'll see there's four options to choose from. And now while that might seem a little overwhelming in 90% of use cases, I'll only ever use two of the options here, which is our row and our column. And the difference between the two is that a column allows you to stack elements from top to bottom on your page. So if I was to just select this here and then add in two buttons on our page, what you'll see is that these are now stacked on top of each other. So the page is going to be stacked vertically from top to bottom. However, if I was to then update the container layout to be a row, what you'll see is that these two elements are positioned side by side, so horizontally. And now contrary to what you might think about this page being split down the middle, so as you can see, there's elements on the left-hand side of the page and also elements on the right, you might be thinking that a row might be the best option for this page layout. However, when it comes to building an actual page, I personally always select the column option because when you think of most web pages out there or even most apps, they're built from top to bottom. So even though elements might be positioned side by side, they're still going to be stacked vertically. And now, although we have selected that our page should be stacked vertically, there will be a way to ensure that we can position our elements side by side like the real world Linktree product here. And the way we can do that is by adding a group element onto our page. So if you're relatively new to Bubble, you can scroll on down to your containers menu here, and you'll see the option to select from the group element. And now as the name suggests, a group acts like a container, which in short, just essentially means you can store a bunch of different elements inside your one group. So you can kind of think of a group like a mini page within your overall page itself. And now because this acts like a mini page, what you'll see is that we have the option to update its container layout. So if I was to set the container layout of this group to be a row, any element I add inside of this group is going to be positioned side by side, not vertically. And the reason why I personally prefer to set the container layout of the page to be a column, so that vertical positioning, is because even though I might position some elements side by side, let's say I wanted to add a footer menu on my page, I'm gonna have to add that below our group, which means I'm gonna be stacking items vertically. But in this instance today, I'm gonna to add most of my elements of the page inside of this group here. And another personal preference that I have when it comes to working in Bubble is that I just like to color code items so that way it looks almost like Lego blocks on my page. So if I was to click away, I can't actually even see that there's a group on my page until I hover over it, which can just create a bit of a tough experience later on if I've got multiple groups on my page, I might lose where they actually are. So what I like to do when I'm actually just building my app is I like to select on my group here. I'm gonna head to our style and just choose to remove the style of it. I'm gonna update the background style to be a flat color and I'm just gonna update this to be a light shade of red. You can make this whatever color you want. And now, of course, while I'm building my page, I'm gonna give this a color, but when I go to preview or even publish my application, I can always choose to remove this style at any point and it will just clean things up. But as I mentioned, if I was to start stacking different groups on my page, I just like to color code them so I can actually get an idea of where everything is visually within my overall bubble editor. And now when it comes to this group here, as I mentioned, it's going to allow us to position two elements side by side. So on the left hand side, I'm gonna have all of our input fields. And then on the right hand side, I'm gonna have our image. But what I need to do is just make this group stretch across the full width of our page. So at this point in time, you can see it's only taking up this small little section. And that's because if I head over to the layout tab of our group within our property editor here, I can see that the width of this group is set to be 400 pixels. And it's also selected to be a fixed width by default. Now that just means that this group is only ever going to be 400 pixels, regardless of how wide or small the page becomes. And if I open up my responsive menu here, what you'll see is that this looks somewhat fine on our page as the size of it increases. But if the page width was to decrease below 400 pixels, this group itself is just going to get cut off. It's not going to become responsive. 
And today I want to help us create a fully responsive experience on our registration page. And so what we're going to do in order to make that happen is we're going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. And I'm going to set the minimum width of our group here to be zero. And I'm going to leave the maximum width of it to now be infinite. And so what that just means is that this group will now be fully responsive regardless of our actual page width. So that just means that regardless if the page is at zero pixels, so the smallest it could possibly be, or infinite pixels, so whatever size someone is viewing it on the largest possible device, this group is going to be fully responsive. So if I was to open up my responsive menu once again, what you'll now see is that this group will stretch out and contract with our page. So it is now creating a fully responsive experience. And now you'll hear me reference this particular configuration over and over again today. In my opinion, if you want to create a fully responsive experience on Bubble, in most instances, what you need to do is just set the minimum width of zero and leave a maximum width of infinite, which just means that all of your elements will contract and expand based on the size of a user's browser or device. And so I'm going to revisit that concept many times throughout our build. I would also like to update the height of this element, but before I do that, I'm going to need to add in everything I'd like to display within this group. So that's going to be our image on the right hand side, as well as all of our input fields on the left. And so back in our bubble editor here, what I'm going to do is jump over to my UI builder and I'm actually going to add in the image on the right hand side first. And now I have personally just saved a version of this image. If you'd like to save a version yourself, what you can do is choose to inspect the element within this page. And if you were to open this up, what you would eventually find is the link to the image here, which if you were to open that link up in a browser, it'll display the full image for you and you can choose to save an image. So if I was to click on this, it's going to open it up in a browser, then you can right click and download that image. I'm just going to close this for now though. And then within my bubble editor, I'm going to head to my visual elements in the top here. And I'm going to select to add an image into my red group here. And when it comes to this image, I'm just going to upload a static image, which is the image that I've just saved. So I'm going to choose to upload this from my local device here. And now by default, what you'll see is that this image is squished on our page. So what we're going to need to do is update the dimensions of this image itself. So if I jump to our layout tab, you'll see I have the option to update the width and the height of this element. And now I've just experimented around in the past, but what I found is that if I was to unselect that this should be a fixed width, meaning this image will now expand out or contract based on our page size, what I can do is select to add a maximum width of 512 pixels and set the minimum width to be zero, which just means that this image will be no larger than 512 pixels in width, so this size here. And if the minimum width is zero, it will be able to scale down within these two dimensions. So if I was to open up my responsive menu here, what you'll see is that if my browser was to expand outwards, it's not going to scale past 512 pixels. But if I reduce this, the image will continually shrink because its minimum width is zero. What I am also going to do is just update the height settings here. So I'm gonna give this a maximum height of 1200. And now the reason I've selected that is because the actual height of the image is in fact 1200 pixels. But I'm also going to set the minimum height to be 800. And as you'll see, that will now expand this out on my page. So at minimum, this image itself will be 800 pixels in height. But if it ever needs to scale out and update its aspect ratio, it has a bit of room to move up to 1200 pixels if it's needed. And as you can see, that's how we can add our image onto our page. What you'll also see here is that the red group that it sits within has also expanded out. And that's just because this group has an infinite max height here, which just means it's going to indefinitely scale out. What you might also notice is we have this option selected here to fit the height of this element to the content within it. And so because our image element sits inside of our red group, it's going to automatically collapse around the height of our image. So what I can actually do is set the minimum height of my group to now be zero. And regardless of whatever elements are added into this group, our overall red group will collapse and fit nicely around those. And so you can see a bit of a pattern here when it comes to my responsive settings. I have a minimum width of zero and a maximum width of infinite. 
and I also have a minimum height of zero and a maximum height of infinite, which just means that I'm giving Bubble complete control to make my element responsive, regardless of what device or size of a user's browser someone accesses our product through. And now this is how we can add our image onto the page, but of course we're gonna to need to add in some text and some input fields in order to actually register a user's account. And so in order to do that, what I'm gonna to need to do is add yet another group inside of my red group. Because if you remember our overall red group that we've selected here, its container layout is set to be a row. So any element added inside of this is going to be positioned side by side. Whereas what you can actually see is that our input fields here are stacked on top of each other. So they're stacked vertically. And so if I was to add yet another group inside of my existing red group here, what you'll see is that this new group is in fact positioned side by side to my image. So it's stacked horizontally, but because groups behave, as I'd mentioned, as a mini page inside your overall page, we can of course update the container layout of them. And so what I'm gonna do is update the container layout of this group to be a column, which means I now have the ability to stack elements vertically. And inside of this group, I'm gonna add in all of our input elements. Before I do that though, what I'm gonna do is jump over to my appearance tab. I'm just going to remove the style of this group and give it a flat color as the background. And I might make this just a light shade of blue. Once again, because while I'm just working on the development version of my product, I just wanna make sure I can see where everything is on the actual app itself. Of course, we can update these colors at any later point. What I'd also like to do is position this group on the left-hand side of our image here. So I'm gonna to head to my layout tab and move this to the previous position within my red group. And now it'll be positioned on the right side of our page. I'm also going to update some of the responsive settings of this group before I add any of our elements inside of it. And so in order to do that, I'm going to unselect that this element should be a fixed width. And then similar to before, I'm gonna set the minimum width as zero, and I'm gonna leave the maximum width as infinite, which means that this group is going to take up as little or as much space as it's allowed to within our overall red group. And because it's sharing space with our image, it knows that it can only take up half of the space of our page here. And once again, if I jump over into my responsive tab here, what you'll see is that this group will expand or contract based on the width of our browser at the time. I'll jump back into my UI builder. And now later on, I will be coming to update the height settings of this group. But before I do that, what I'd like to do is add in all of the elements that are going to sit inside of my group. And the first element I'd like to add is going to be just a text element that prompts someone to create a new account. And so I'm gonna add a text element within my blue group here. And I'm going to have this text display the words create an account for free. I'm also gonna to want to update the styling of this text. So what I'm gonna do is choose to remove the default style here. And I'm gonna to choose to update the font size to be 36. I'll also choose to bold this text. And as you can see, we now have a larger title here, but of course it's currently not responsive within our blue group. So what I'm gonna do is head to my layout tab and I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'll once again set the minimum width to be zero, leaving the maximum width to be infinite. And now of course that's going to make this element completely responsive regardless of the size of our page. I'm also going to set the minimum height to be zero, leaving the maximum height as infinite. And I'm doing that because we have this option selected here to fit the height of this element to the content within it. So the content within it is the actual text itself. So that just means that this element is going to collapse nicely around all of this text, regardless of its size. And if let's say this text had to be broken down onto a separate line, this element would expand and make that fit. And then finally, I'm also going to add in some margin around this particular element. I'm gonna add in 50 pixels of margin at the top, 50 on the left and 50 on the right. And what you'll now see is that this text will in fact break down onto a new line. But if I was to open up my responsive menu here, what you'll see is that as we expand the page out, this text element will have room to fit all of this on one line. And of course, if I was to contract the page, what you'll see is that this text is completely responsive as the width of our page closes. What I'd like to do from here though, is just add in a series of input fields which are going to allow our users to store the information they'd like to save within their account. 
And when it comes to adding in input fields, we're gonna to need to scroll on down in our element menu here and head to our input forms. And I'm gonna add in just a regular input field here, which will allow someone to type into this and store a particular value. And before I make any changes to this input field, the first thing I'm gonna do is just update the name of this. So if I was to click on the name here, I'm just gonna call this input username. And the value in updating the name of your elements is that when you later reference this in a workflow, you can easily interpret which data you need to store from which particular input field. So I know that when I need to save a username for someone's account, it's going to be the value that's been added into this input field here. From here, I'm also just going to update the placeholder text field. And now the placeholder text is just the little text preview here that displays until someone actually clicks into this field and then types in a value of their own. I'm just going to replace this with the same text that was added into the link tree input field on their page. So it just prompts someone to add a username of their own. After adding in our placeholder text, I'm then going to head on down to the style of this input field. I'm just gonna to choose to remove the style of this just because I'd like to update the background color here to be a darker shade of gray. So I'm just gonna paste in my new color code here. And if you'd like that color code, it's F2, F2, F2. And while we're here, I'm also going to update the roundness of the borders on this input field to be 10. So that way the edges are slightly curved. I'm then of course gonna to need to make sure this input field is responsive and update the position within our overall blue group here. So I'm gonna to jump to my layout tab. And as you probably guessed, I'm gonna to need to update the width of this element first. And I'm gonna do that by unselecting that this should be a fixed width. I'll of course be setting the minimum width to be zero, making sure I leave the maximum width as infinite. And now when it comes to the height of this input field, I am gonna keep this as a fixed height at 45 pixels because I'm quite happy with the height of this input field. And this input field, when someone adds in a text element is going to expand to the side, not vertically. And so this input field won't ever need to be higher than 45 pixels. So that's why I'm happy to leave that as a fixed height. And then finally, the other thing I'd like to do is add in some margin around this particular field. So I'm going to add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 50 pixels of margin on the left and 50 pixels of margin on the right. And that's just going to ensure that our input field will be in line with the text element we've added above it there. And now one thing I would just like to point out is that whenever someone registers a username for their own Linktree account, we're gonna to need to create a way for that username to be unique within our database. We don't want two people with the same usernames. And so a way in which I can prevent that from happening is just by showing some text that almost says like an alert message to someone if they select a username that already exists within our database. And now this is a little bit more of an advanced feature if you are relatively new to Bubble, but I just wanted to make sure I took the time to explain this to you now, so that way you could include this feature within your build. What I'm gonna to do today is scroll on up to our visual elements, and I'm just gonna add a text element directly below our input field that displays the username. And when it comes to the text that's displayed here, I want this to display the words username taken. I'll also then just remove the style of this because I'd like to bold this text and update the font color just to be a shade of a red, so that way it looks like an error or an alert message. I'm then gonna to want to jump to our layout tab and update its position within our page. And of course, I'm gonna make this fully responsive as well. So I'm gonna unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width to zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. I can see we have the option selected to fit the height of this element to the content within it. So if I set the minimum height to be zero, it's now going to collapse around that nicely as well. And then finally, I can add a left margin of 50 and a right margin of 50. I won't, however, add any margin at the top just because I want this element to be touching the input field above it. And now by default, this text element will in fact be visible on our page. And that's not what I want to happen. I only want this text element to be visible if someone types in a username that is already taken within our database. So what I'm gonna do is unselect that this element should be visible on our page load. So that means that by default, it's gonna be hidden. I'm also gonna take this box here to collapse this element when it's hidden, which just means that if this text element isn't being displayed, any elements below this will move up and take its place. 
So that way we're not just gonna have this big empty gap on our page. What I'm then gonna need to do is create a condition that allows us to identify when this text element should in fact be displayed. And the circumstance of when it should be displayed will be when someone selects a username that is already taken. And so if we head to our conditional tab here, this is just gonna allow us to define the behavior in which we want this element to be showcased. So I'm going to define a new condition here. And what I'm gonna do within this is just perform a search through my database and identify if anyone's username equals the same value as the text that's added in this input field. And if the count of that search is greater than zero, meaning that someone has added a username that already exists, what I'd like to do is identify that we should display this element. And so as I mentioned, what I'm gonna do is perform a search through my database for all of the users where their username data field equals the same value as the input username on our page. So it's value. And if the count of that value is greater than zero, so I'm just gonna type in the number zero, what I'd like to do is select that this element should be visible and tick that that should be true. And now that would just ensure that we're able to display our error message when someone doesn't select a unique username, so a username that already exists. From here, what we can do is continue adding all of our input fields onto the page to store the additional information we want for our user's account. So not only do I want to store a username, but I'd like to also store a email and a password. And in order to streamline that whole process, what I'm gonna do is just make a copy of this input field here. I'm gonna to head to our layout tab and move that to the next position within our blue group here. And when you copy an element across, what you'll see is that it maintains all of the design settings that we had previously created. So we won't need to rebuild those from scratch. The only changes I'd like to make is of course, I want to update the name of this input field to be called input email. I'm also gonna to jump to our appearance tab and update the placeholder text to also display the word email. So that way users know this is where they in fact add their email address. And then finally, because we're storing a value of an email address, I'm gonna to need to update the content format here, not to be a text element, but instead to be an email. And what that's gonna do is just allow Bubble to validate the type of information that's added into this field. So it's only gonna allow users to add in a valid email format. So that's gonna be whatever their name is at gmail.com, at hotmail.com, or even at their own domain.com. And then from here, I'm going to make one last copy of this input field, and I'm going to update the name of this to be called input password. I'll update the placeholder text to be password. And then finally, I'll update the content format to also be a password, which just means that it's going to hide whatever characters are added into this field here. And now that is all of the input fields I wanna add within our blue group here. What I'd like to do is just add a button element below this, which when clicked will run our first workflow, which of course will sign a user's account up within our database. So what I'm gonna do is select to add a button element into our group. And I'm gonna update the text of this button to display the words register account. I'm then gonna to want to update the style of this button. But because I'm gonna to want to use this particular style that I create later on throughout my application, instead of removing the style, what I'm gonna do is choose to edit the existing style. And now styles in Bubble just allow you to create a design setting once, and then you can reference it later on within your application wherever you would like. And so because I want to create a purple button like the real world Linktree product today, I'm gonna to want to reference that at different points in my application. So instead of having to remove the style and create it every single time, what I'm gonna do is choose to just edit the style of our primary button style here. And I'm gonna just change the background color to be a shade of purple. If you'd like the color code I'm using, it's 8202C7. I'm also gonna set the roundness of this to be a 20 here. And if you really wanted, you could also just head over to the condition here. And what you'll see is that there's a condition already predetermined that just updates the background color whenever this button is hovered. So when a user hovers over this button, it's gonna be this shade of blue. What I'd like to do is just add in the same purple color code, and perhaps I could just make it a lighter shade of purple, or even a darker shade of purple if I'd want. And if I really want it, I could toggle this on and off to see what this is gonna look like when that's hovered, but that's just a personal preference that I have. 
If I was to jump back into my design tab, what you'll now see is that this button element here is completely updated. It's our purple color. And so what I'm gonna do is jump over to our layout tab because I'll need to update the responsive settings of this button. And once again, similar to before, what I'm gonna do is unselect that this element should be a fixed width. I'm gonna set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. Now I am happy to keep the minimum height at 45 pixels, just because that is the current height of the button. I will of course make sure that we've selected this option to fit the height of this element to the content within it. And then finally, I'm just gonna add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, and similar to before, 50 pixels of margin, both on the left and the right hand side. And that is all of the elements I'd like to add within our blue group here. What I'd also just like to do is now select on my blue group, head to my layout tab, and because I finished adding all of my elements into this group, I'm just gonna set the minimum height to be zero, which just means it's going to collapse around all of the elements inside of it. And then finally, I'm also just gonna add in 100 pixels of additional margin at the top of this group just so that way all of the elements shuffle down on our page a bit, so that way it's not positioned directly at the top there. And now from here, what we can do is go ahead and build out the workflow that's going to run whenever we want to register someone's new account. So we're gonna select on the register account button here. We'll jump over to our appearance tab and we'll choose to start a workflow whenever someone clicks this button here. And within this workflow, the first thing we're gonna to wanna to do is sign a user's account up. So we're gonna select from our account events here and we'll select the sign the user up option. And what you'll now see is that Bubble will require us to register a valid email and password for this person's account. And of course, we're gonna pull these values from the input fields stored on our page. So for the email, I'd like this to equal the value of the input email on our page. And as you can see, this is where the naming conventions come into play. So it's nice and easy to determine which particular input field I'm referencing. I'm then also gonna set that the password should be the value of the input password. And what I also love is that when you sign a user's account up, you also have the ability to add any additional data fields that you would like to store for this person. And so what I'm gonna do is choose to change one additional data field on this person's account. And that of course is going to be their username. I'd like this to equal the value of our input username field. It's nice and simple. And now after registering someone's account here, what I'd also like to do is set what's referred to as a user's profile slug. So because every user has a unique username, what I'd like to do is update the link of their Linktree profile page to be, let's say, linktree.com slash their username. And so in order to create that experience, what you'll need to do is set what's called a slug on a user's profile. And no, I'm not talking about the slimy slugs that you might think come into mind. A slug is just referred to as a custom URL string, which allows you to, as I mentioned, just customize the display of a URL on a particular page. And so if I was to add an additional step into our workflow here, I'm just gonna type in the word slug, and you'll see that I can set a things slug. And the slug, of course, is our custom URL string. And so the thing I would like to change is going to be the current user. And now the current user is the person who has just signed up an account within step one of our workflow here. And then the actual slug value itself is just going to be the person's username. So that's going to be the custom snippet of the URL that will be displayed on their profile. And if someone ever wants to share their profile link, all they can do is just type in, let's say linktree.com slash their username and that will then redirect someone to their profile page. So I'm gonna to choose to insert dynamic data here, and I'd like the slug to equal the current user, so once again, the person who's just signed up an account, their username value. And now that's everything I'll need to change within this particular user's account. One thing I'd like to point out though, is that at this point in time, our workflow would have run, and we have in fact registered a new user's account. But at this point in time, the user would select our register account button, that workflow would run and they'd just stay positioned on this page here, nothing would happen. So what I wanna do is redirect a user through to a settings page, which will enable them to update any additional information they'd like to store within their account. And so I'm gonna head over to our workflow editor once again, and I'm gonna add an additional step within our existing workflow here. And as I mentioned, I wanna redirect someone through to a settings page. 
So I'm going to head to our navigation events and select the go to page action. In this case, our destination page does not yet exist. So we're going to need to create a new page from scratch here. I'm just going to call this the settings page. I'll choose to create this. And now I can select that the destination page will be our settings page and the user will be redirected through to that page whenever they have successfully created an account. And look, that's everything we'll need to build out within this workflow. And it pretty much finishes everything I needed to add onto my registration page. The very last thing I'd like to do, and I just want to do this because I'm being picky, is just update some of the responsive settings of our overall page here. So if I was to open up my responsive tab and view this page on a full size browser, what you'll see is that this page looks quite nice. But of course, if I was to reduce the size of this, what you'll soon find is that our image will become quite narrow and so will all of our input fields. And so what I'm going to do is choose to hide our image on the right hand side whenever the width of our page goes below a certain value. And for that value, I might make it, let's say, around about this mark here. So at around about 860 pixels, you can start to see our input fields are becoming quite small. So what I might like to do is just choose to hide this image here whenever the page is smaller than 860 pixels. And then our blue group here will move over and take its place. And so what I'm going to do here is select on my image. I'm going to jump over into my conditional tab here. And I'm going to define a new condition. And I'm just going to recognize when the current page width, so if I type in the word width, I'll select from the current page width. When the width is less than, and I'm just going to type in 860, I'm going to select that this element is visible and not tick that that should be true. I'm also going to head to my layout tab and just tick this box here to collapse this element when it's hidden which as you'll now see, when the page moves below 860 pixels in width, that image will be hidden and our blue group will move over and take its place. I can then choose to expand our page out and that image will now also be displayed. And that is how we can create a truly responsive experience on our user registration page here. What I'd love to now do though is to show you a preview of what this page is going to look like within our own application. So if we go and select to run a preview of our app here, what you'll see is that our page is on a full size browser. So all of our elements are being displayed. But if I was to reduce the width of this, what you'll see is that at 860 pixels, our image is going to be hidden. And of course the text and input fields will be completely responsive to the smaller size that my browser can possibly become. I'm just going to expand everything back out though, because at this point in time, I'd like to register a new account. And as you'll see, our red text isn't being displayed because we haven't yet added anything into this input field. But if I was to add in my username, what I'll also see is that our red text was not shown just because this username has not yet been taken within our app. I'll also add in an email address. I'm just going to say test1 at gmail.com. I'll add in a very secure password. And then I'll choose to register my account here. This workflow will run. It's then going to redirect me through to my settings page, which you'll see within my app here, which of course, at this point in time, this page is blank. So there's going to be nothing on this page. But as you can see in our URL string here, we are in fact on our user settings page. And that's everything I wanted to show within this particular section of our tutorial. This was definitely one of the more advanced registration pages I've ever had to build out. Normally it's a relatively straightforward process. You just add three elements on a page and it's good to go from there. But because Linktree is quite a nicely designed website, I just wanted to make sure we could replicate all of the same features from the real world product. Back in my Notion checklist, I'm just going to tick off that we've finished building out our user registration page, which of course throughout that process, I explained how we could allow users to only register a unique username as well as how we could redirect someone through to our settings page once they've registered an account. And of course, we made this page a fully responsive regardless of a user's browser size. At this point in our tutorial, I wanted to move along to one of the first real core features that users are going to engage with in order to build their own Linktree profiles. And that is going to be the home page, which allows users to add a list of all of the links that they want to actually display on their profile. And then on that page, I also want to show a preview of what a user's profile will look like. 
And now I think that before we actually start building this page out, it'd be quite helpful to show you an example of what the real world Linktree homepage looks like. So over in a separate tab here, I've just created a brand new account and I've just added in a couple of test links. And look, as you'll see, this page itself is broken into three different sections. In the first section on the left hand side here, we've got a navigation menu, which is displayed vertically. Then in the middle, we have our section which allows us to add all of our links in which we can choose to rearrange the order of those links if we'd like. And then on the right hand side, we have a section that's dedicated to showing us a preview of our profile. So you can see all of our links here, as well as a preview of what our actual profile theme looks like. And all of this can easily be replicated within our own bubble app today. And I'm going to be showing you how we can create each of these individual sections. And so what I'm going to do is just jump back into my browser here that has my bubble editor. I'm going to open this up and over in my bubble editor, I'm going to open up my index page, which now the index page is referred to as the default home page for any bubble app. So whenever someone opens your application, this is the page they're going to land on. And at this point in time, a bubble leaves the index page a blank. And so that gives us a blank canvas to work around in our build today. And now, like always, the first thing I'm going to do on this page is just open up my property editor here. And I'm going to choose to just update the background color of this page to just be a light shade of gray. So that way I can actually see where it sits within my bubble canvas here. I'm also going to need to update the layout of this page before I can go ahead and add any elements onto it. Now, when it comes to this page here, although as you can see, the page is broken down into three different sections, Contrary to what you might think, I'm still going to set the container layout of my page to be a column, which means we're going to stack our page from top to bottom, not side to side. And the reason I'm doing that is because later on when we build out our responsive experience, if this browser here was to contract in width, what I'd like to do is hide the right and left hand groups. And instead of displaying a vertical navigation menu, what I'd like to do is display a horizontal navigation menu that takes its place when it's hidden. And that technically means that I'm going to be stacking elements on top of each other, not side by side. Although what I will do on my overall page is add a group that allows me to stack each of these sections horizontally across our page. And I know that might sound confusing if you're relatively new to bubble, but I'm going to be sure to explain that in as much detail as I can as I walk through the process. So over in our bubble editor here, I'm going to head to my layout tab for our overall page. And I'm going to start by setting the container layout to be a column, which means I'm going to be stacking elements from top to bottom. So vertically, and then from here, what I can do is add all of my elements onto the page. And as I mentioned, because I do in fact want to stack some of the elements side by side, so horizontally across my page, I'm going to first need to head to my containers menu to add in a group element. And as I previously mentioned, a group is almost like a page within your page. So you can think of it like a little mini page here. And because of course you can update the container layout of a page, you can also update the container layout of a group. And so I'm going to stretch this group across the full width of our page, and I'm going to update its container layout to be a row, which is where I'm going to add each of my three sections. So they're going to sit inside this little mini page inside my overall page. Of course, just a personal preference that I have is that I'm going to jump to my appearance tab. I'm going to remove the style of this group, update the background style to be a flat color. And I'm just going to set this to be a light shade of red. So that way for the time being, I can actually see where it sits on my page. I don't have to guess where it's going to be sitting. Of course, when we go to preview or publisher application, we can update that color at any given point in time. I'd also just like to head over to my layout tab once again because I just want to update the width settings for this group before I start to add my elements into it. So what I'm going to do is unselect that this element should be a fixed width, which means that it now has an infinite width, which in short just means that it's going to scale out to any size that the browser is. And then if I was to update the minimum width to be zero, this just means that it will also contract to the smallest possible size. So I might just show you a quick demo once again, but at this point in our build, this red group here will be fully responsive regardless of what size the page is. And that's exactly the experience we want to create today. I'm just going to jump back into my UI builder here because what I'd like to now do is add in each of the three different sections that are going to sit within my overall red group here. And the first one is going to be that navigation menu that sat on the left hand side of my page. 
And as you might remember, that navigation menu was quite a long vertical bar that sat on our page. And so because I'll be stacking the elements I want inside of that group vertically, that means I'm gonna have to set its container layout to be a column. So what I'm gonna do is choose to add a, another group within my existing group here. And while I'm working on this, I might also just update the name of this group to be called left hand menu. So that way, if at any point I need to reference this group, I know what it's called within my element tree here. And what I'm gonna do with this group is first of all, just head to my appearance tab. I'm going to remove the style of this and I'm gonna set the background color to be a flat color. I'm happy to leave this as white for now. I'm then gonna jump over to my layout tab. And as I mentioned, I'd like to update the container layout to be a column because I'll be stacking the elements in this group from top to bottom, not side to side. I'm then gonna update the width settings of this group. And now, as you might remember, the group itself didn't take up much width on my overall page. So unlike most of the groups that I'm gonna add into our build today, I am still going to unselect that this should be a fixed width, which means that it will now have the correct settings to be responsive. But what I wanna do is set the minimum width as zero, but in this case, I'm gonna add a maximum width of 80 pixels. And the reason why I've selected 80 pixels is just because that's enough width to add in all of the elements I want inside of this group here. And so with these settings here, it essentially just means that this group with a minimum width of zero will still contract if the page becomes smaller. But if the page was to expand out, it's never gonna be greater than 80 pixels at any given time, which is this width here. I'm also then gonna create a similar experience for the height of this group. So I'm gonna set the minimum height here to be 600 pixels, which means that it's just going to expand down our page. And I am gonna leave the maximum height here to be infinite, which just means that if it ever needs to scale downwards and take up more space, it can do that. But the main value here that I'm adding in is that minimum height of 600 pixels. As you can see, it's just elongated this group out here. So it's starting to look more like an actual menu. From here though, what we can do is actually add our elements into this group. And now I'm gonna create a really simple version of the menu in our application today. At the top, I'm just gonna include the Linktree logo. And then at the bottom, I'm just going to display a user's profile, which when clicked will redirect a user through to a settings page. I'm just gonna move my head out of the way for now though, because what I'd like to do is head to my visual elements. I'm gonna add an image element into our white group here. And now when it comes to this image, I'm just gonna upload a static image I have of a Linktree logo. And as you can see, this image is quite large and it still does in fact sit within my white group, although it looks like it's scaled out of it. So what we're gonna do is jump to our layout tab because of course we'll need to update the size of this. And now when it comes to the width of this image, I'm gonna set this to be a 40 pixels. And when it comes to the height, I'm gonna set that to be 60 pixels. But what I'm also gonna do is make sure that both of those values are fixed, which I can see that by default the width is. But when it comes to the height, I'm gonna to need to select this option as well. And what that just ensures is that at any given time, regardless of the size of a user's browser, this image is going to be a 40 pixels in width and 60 pixels in height no more or no less. And as you can see, that makes it look like a smaller size logo. And the reason why I've selected 40 and 60 is just because they are the dimensions that fit the aspect ratio of this image. I did just have to play around with those when I initially built this out, but I'll save you the time and you can just set those as they are there. What I would like to do though, is just add in 30 pixels of margin at the top of this image, just so that way it's not touching the very top of our white group here. And I'm also gonna want this image to be placed in the center of our white group. So I'm gonna update the horizontal alignment of this image to be centered. From here, I'm then going to add in our image element, which will display a user's profile photo, which as I mentioned, when that is clicked, it's gonna redirect someone through to their settings page. So under our visual elements, I'm going to add in an image into our white group here. Now, when it comes to this image, I'm gonna to want to display a user's profile photo. So I'm gonna to choose to insert dynamic data, which allows me to just reference a value already stored in our database. In which case, I'm obviously gonna to want to display someone's profile photo. So I'm gonna to choose to insert dynamic data here, and I'd like to display the current user. So that is the person who is logged in, viewing their own Linktree account. I'd like to display their profile photo. And now when it comes to displaying small images, particularly images that are a circle, which I'm going to change this in a moment to be a circle, 
I personally just like to select this more option and also process this image with Imgix just because I like to tick this option here to resize and fit the dimensions by cropping it, which just means that if a user's profile photo doesn't fit into this whole space here, it will just zoom in and crop around that image so it fits nicely in that space. Again, that's just a little personal preference that I have. I'll just choose to close this now because I'd like to scroll on down and just set the roundness of this image to be 100. So that way it becomes a perfect circle. I'll also set the border to be a solid color. So that way I can see where it actually sits on our page. And now again, you can choose to remove this border whenever you preview or publish your app, but it's just a personal preference I have while I'm building it. I'm then gonna jump into my layout tab because I'd like to update the size and the positioning of this image here. And when it comes to this image, I'm going to update the width of it to be 50 pixels. I'm gonna keep this as a fixed width and I'm also gonna tick this box to keep this elements aspect ratio fixed. And I'm gonna keep that ratio as one to one. So that way my image is now 50 pixels by 50 pixels, which makes the actual element itself a perfect square. I'm also gonna to want to horizontally align this in the center of my white group. And I'm going to add in 30 pixels of margin at the bottom of this. And now of course, as you can see at this point, our image is placed directly below our logo here. So what I'm gonna to need to do is create a way to expand this image here down to the bottom of our group. And the way I can do that is by selecting on the actual white group itself. And you'll see an option under our container layout to update the container alignment of the elements that sit within it. So this just determines where exactly the elements are going to be positioned inside of our white group. And as you can see, they're all positioned at the top of our group right now. Whereas if I was to position these at the bottom, it's gonna move all of the elements to the bottom. But what you'll see is there's an option here that allows us to position an even amount of space between these two elements, which just means that they're going to be positioned on either side of our group. And because we have 30 pixels of margin at the bottom and at the top of these elements, they're not going to touch the actual borders of the group itself. And so that's how we can create the design style similar to the real world link tree product. The very last thing I'd like to do within this group is just create the workflow that's gonna redirect someone through to the settings page whenever they click on their own profile photo, because in that case, they might like to update the details stored in their own profile account. And so I'm gonna to jump to my appearance tab here. I'm gonna to choose to start a new workflow whenever this image is clicked. And within this workflow, I'm gonna select from the navigation event and I'll choose the go to page action. And in this case, I'd like the destination page to be our settings page that we had previously created. And I won't need to send any data through to this page just yet, but I'll be explaining when later on in our tutorial we'll need to do that. For now though, I'm just gonna jump back into my design tab. I'm gonna close my property editor here because the next thing I'd like to do is add yet another group onto my overall red group here, which is going to add in the next section of our homepage. And that section will include everything a user needs to start adding links onto their own Linktree profile. And so within that, I'm going to add a couple of buttons, which when clicked, will allow someone to create a new link. And then I'm also going to allow someone to edit the details of a link. So things like the actual name of the link, as well as the destination URL. And then finally, later on, we're gonna be building out a feature that enables someone to reposition where those links sit on their page. And I'm gonna be explaining how we can do that in full detail. But for the time being, what I'd like to do is add another group into my existing red group here. So I'm gonna scroll on down to my containers menu. I'm going to add yet another group inside of our existing group. And the first thing I'm gonna do is just update the name of this to be called group links. So that way I know that this is the group that houses all of the content that is relevant to creating links. I'm then just gonna to choose to remove the style of this group just because a personal preference of mine is that I like to color code my groups whenever I'm working with them. So I'm gonna set this background style to be a flat color. I'll then update this color just to be a light shade of blue here, just so I can see where it actually sits on my page. And then from here, I'm going to just jump over into my layout tab because I'd like to update the container layout as well as the width settings for this group before I start to add all of my elements inside of it. So I'm gonna start by updating the container layout to be a column because within this group, I'm gonna be stacking elements on top of each other. So vertically, which of course means I'm gonna to have to select the column container option. I'm then going to scroll on down to my width settings and like always choose to unselect that this should be a fixed width. 
I'm going to set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. And what you'll see is that because the maximum width is infinite, it's going to take up all of the remaining space within our red group. But later on, when we add the third section of our homepage into our product, this group will know that it needs to share space with that additional group. So that just means that it's automatically going to collapse and share an even amount of space. So this group isn't always going to be this particular width. But while we're building it here, it's going to seem like it's much larger than it's actually going to be. And now within this group, I'd like to add in a series of elements. And the first elements that I'd like to add in is going to be two buttons that sit side by side. The first button when clicked will allow someone to create a new link. And then the second button when clicked will send someone through to preview a real version of their Linktree profile page. And so because these two button elements are actually going to sit side by side, I'm going to need to add yet another group within my existing blue group here. And I know that that might sound quite confusing, but what you'll need to remember here is that my blue group, which we're going to add all of our relevant link elements into, so things to create and manage our links, the container layout of this group is set to be a column. And that's because I want to have the two buttons to sit at the top, and then I want to have a list of all of my links below this. So technically they are going to be stacked vertically, but when it comes to my two buttons at the top, these are going to be positioned horizontally side by side. So what I'm going to need to do is add in yet another group into my existing blue group here. I'm going to update the container layout of this to be a row because I'll be stacking two elements in this side by side. I'm then going to jump to my appearance tab and just update the color of this so I can actually see where it sits in my page. I'll choose to remove the style of this and add a flat background color. I'm happy to leave this as white for the time being. And then finally, I'm going to jump to my layout tab here and I'm going to just update the width settings of this particular group. So I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. And what you'll now see is that this group pretty much just takes up all of the space in our existing blue group. But once I finish adding in my buttons, we're gonna come back and update the height. So that way it collapses up and we'll see the remaining space that we have inside of that blue group. But within our white group here, I'm gonna start adding in my two button elements. So if we scroll on up to our visual elements here, I'm going to add in our first button and the text on this button is just going to display the words add a new link and I'm happy with the style as it is for this particular button. I'm just going to jump to my layout tab though because I'm going to want to update some of the width settings as well as the padding for this button. So at this point in time I can see that this button is fixed at 150 pixels in width which just means that regardless of how wide or short the page becomes this button will always be 150 pixels at any given point in time. Whereas what I'd actually like to do is expand this button out to a certain width, just because it looks quite small with all of this empty space here. So what I'm going to do is choose to unselect that this element should be a fixed width. I'm going to set the minimum width as zero, which means it can shrink to the smallest possible size. But instead of leaving the maximum width as infinite, as you can see it takes up all of this space, what I'm going to do is actually set a maximum width of 300 pixels. And now the reason why I'm selecting 300 pixels is it's just a purely personal preference. I think that this is a good maximum width for this button. I won't want it to get any longer than that. But at the same time, I'm happy for this to become responsive and shrink down if it needs to. And so what you'll see in my responsive menu here is that when my page is at its full width here, the full 300 pixels of this button are being displayed. But if I was to reduce the width of this page, because this button has no minimum width, it's going to continually shrink down. I'm also just happy to keep the height at 45 pixels. I don't want to make any changes there. The only other thing I will want to change though is just the margins on this button. So if I just jump to my layout tab again, I'm going to add in 30 pixels of margin at the top and 30 pixels of margin on the left, just so that way this button element doesn't touch the borders of my overall white group. And that's everything I'll need to edit for this button here. What I'm going to do though is just make a direct copy of this button and paste this in. Only this time I'm going to jump over to my appearance tab and update the text that's displayed within this button to show the words preview profile. So essentially when this button is clicked, I'm going to want to redirect someone through to their profile page where they can actually see the real live version of their Linktree profile. Then when it comes to the styling of this button, I'm going to choose to actually remove the style of our primary button because I'm just going to want to pretty much invert the color here. 
So instead of having a purple background, I'm going to have a white background, but instead have a purple border and purple text. And so what I'm going to do is just choose to copy this purple color code here. I'm then going to set the background color to be white. I'm going to then update the color of the text to be that purple color code. And then finally, I'm going to set a solid border around this button. And I'm going to once again update the color of this to be the same purple that I just copied across. And what you'll now see is that this button is the inverted version of our primary button style there. And then the very last thing I'd like to do with this button is just add in some additional margin on the right hand side of it. So you can see it has 30 pixels of margin between our first button, which is great because it spaces it apart. We've also got 30 pixels of margin at the top, so it doesn't touch the border of my group. But what I'm going to do is just jump to my layout tab and now add in 30 pixels of margin on the right which will just ensure that as the page shrinks, this button will not touch the border of my page. And now that's everything I'd like to add within this particular group. So what I'm going to do is select on my overall white group that my button elements sit within. I'm then going to scroll on down to my height settings here. And because we have this option selected to fit the height of this element to the content within it, I'm going to set the minimum height here to be zero. And what you'll now see is that this group will collapse around my two button elements here. And then below this, you'll see all of the remaining space within our blue group that we had initially added. And this is where we're going to add in a list of all of the links that a user has created. And so in order to display a list of links that a user has created, we're going to use an element that's referred to as a repeating group. And now whenever you need to display a list of items within your bubble application, a repeating group is the exact element you'll need to leverage. And now if you're not familiar, repeating groups, as I just mentioned, are a way of displaying a list of things stored within your database. And so a great real world example of when these come into play is if let's say you're building an Instagram application. So you're building your own social platform with a feed on the homepage. If you wanted to add in a feed of photos or videos that people have published, you would add a repeating group element onto your page. Then you would perform a search through your database to display all of the posts that have been published. And so I'm going to scroll on down to my containers menu here, and we're going to add in our first repeating group element. And what you'll see is that this element just looks like a list, kind of like a spreadsheet if you've ever used Excel or Google Sheets before. And so as I mentioned, we can have this repeating group display a list of things that have been created in our database. So if we jump over to our appearance tab here, the first thing you'll notice is that we'll need to update a type of content for this repeating group. So essentially it just needs to know what type of data it should display. And in this case, we want to display a list of links that have been created in our database. So we're going to set this to be the link data type that we had previously created when we built out our initial database. And then from here, it's going to need a way to know which particular links to display. And in this case, I want to display a list of links that have been created by the current person. So the person who's logged in and is choosing to build out their own Linktree profile. And so what I'm going to do is perform a search in my database for all of the links where the person who created these links, so where the created by field equals the same value as the current user. So that is the person who is logged in viewing their own profile settings here. And then what I'm also going to do is choose to sort these links in a particular order. So if you remember when we built out our database, I'd mentioned that we have a data field under our link data type called the position number. So this will just determine which position our links are displayed on within our user's link tree profile. So if a link is in position number one, it will be the first link that displays. If it's in position number two, it'll be the second link that displays and so on. And so what we're going to do is we're going to choose to sort all of these links here that were created by the current user by their position number. And I'm going to set the descending value to be no, which just means that link number one is going to sit at the top. Link number two is going to sit second. Link number three is going to sit third and so on. That's everything we'll need to configure for our data source though. So I'm going to choose to close this. And now this is where the real fun can begin. And by fun, I mean more things that are probably going to confuse you, but also things that I'm more than happy to explain in detail. So when it comes to repeating groups, they can be quite tedious to get your head around in the beginning. So essentially we have a list of items here, which is now going to be a list of links. And what we'll need to do is build out all of the content we want to display for every single link in our database. 
So for each link, I want to display the name of that link as well as the destination URL. And later on, we're gonna be building out ways for people to upload custom thumbnails and photos for those links as well. But the beauty of working with a repeating group in Bubble is that instead of having to design each individual link, so instead of having to write the name for every single entry in our database, all you have to do is edit the first cell of your repeating group and any changes made there will automatically be replicated across each individual cell. So a good example is let's just say I was to add some text into a repeating group here. You'll see that whatever text I add in here is going to be duplicated across every cell. And thankfully Bubble allows us to reference each unique entry's particular data fields. So if I wanted this text to display the name of each link, I could choose to add it in for the first cell and then each individual cell would have a different name that it is allocated within our database. But before we can have some fun building out all of the elements inside of our repeating group, we're gonna need to update the layout of our repeating group. So as you can see, it's just four rows right now and it doesn't take up too much space here, whereas I'd like it to expand across our full blue group that it sits within. And so what I'm gonna do is choose to first of all, unselect that this repeating group should be a fixed number of rows. And what that's gonna do is just ensure that if there's more than four links that need to be displayed, so if a user has created six or 10 links for their profile, every link is going to be displayed on our homepage, not just the first four. Although you only can see four rows here within our editor, the full amount will actually be displayed. I am however gonna keep the number of columns here fixed at one just because I'm only gonna to want to display one link on each individual line here. And then just another personal preference I have when I'm working with repeating groups within my editor is that I just like to remove the style of them and add a solid border around it, just so I can actually see where the borders of the top and bottom of this repeating group sit. And then from here, I'm gonna open up my repeating group again, head to my layout tab. And first of all, I'm gonna update the container layout of this repeating group. And when it comes to our repeating group itself, I'm going to set the container layout to be a column because I'll be stacking elements in this from top to bottom. I'm then gonna to want to update the width settings. So like always, I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm gonna set the minimum width here as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. And what you'll see is it's going to take up all of the additional space within our blue group here. We will come back later on and update some of the additional width and height settings in order to make this fit nicely. But from here, what I'd like to do is actually build out all of the content that's going to be added into each individual link. And just to throw another spanner in the works, I'm going to actually install a plugin today, which is going to help power our real world Linktree experience. So if you're familiar with Linktree, you'll know that you can not only add links into your list of total links in your profile, but you can also choose to rearrange these by dragging them and dropping them within your homepage in whatever order you would like. And now that drag and drop feature isn't something that comes standard within a repeating group element in Bubble. Instead, we're gonna have to install a plugin that's going to allow us to create that experience. And if you are new to Bubble, the whole drag and drop experience can be a little bit overwhelming to build if it is the very first time you're using the platform. But of course, I'm here to help explain things in as much detail as I possibly can, just to simplify the whole process for you. But essentially what we're gonna need to do is head over to our plugin library here. And we're gonna choose to add a new plugin. And so the plugin we're gonna search for today is going to be called Draggable Elements, which you'll see is a free plugin built by Bubble. And as I mentioned, this is going to allow us to drag and drop elements across our page. So I'm gonna to choose to install this here. I'll then close my plugin library and we won't need to configure any of the plugin settings. It's all set up, ready to go for us. I will though jump back into my design tab and the first thing I'm gonna to need to do within my repeating group is add in a section that someone can drop a link into. So let's say someone wants to drag a particular link card. They'll need to be able to drop it in whatever cell of our repeating group they want. And so if I was to scroll on down to our containers menu, what you'll now see is that we have these two additional elements we can add in. There's our drag drop group, and there is a drop area. The first thing I'll need to add within my repeating group cell here is a drop area. So this gray square here is essentially the area in which someone can drop a link into. And later on, we're gonna build out the full workflow that will update the order number of this particular link that's been dropped into this section. 
So let's say someone has a link in position two and they want to move that to be the link in position number one. Later on, they're going to be able to drag that link, drop it into position number one, and it will update its position in our database. So that way we know to display that link first. And now when it comes to this particular element here, we're just going to need to also update the type of content that we store within this. So because we're going to drop a link into this, we just need to set the type of content to be a link. So that way it knows that it's going to receive a link. And we're also just going to need to identify which particular link it sits within inside of our repeating group. So I'm going to set the data source to be the current cells link. And what it refers to as the current cell is just the particular cell it sits within in our repeating group. So this here is cell number one, which means that the current cell is cell number one. Here is cell number two, cell number three, and so on. I'm also then just going to need to update the responsive settings of this particular section here. So for our draggable element, the first thing I'm going to do is set the container layout to be a column because I'll be adding elements in this vertically. Similar to the repeating group it sits within, I'm then going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm going to make this element fully responsive, which means I'm going to set the minimum width as zero and leave the maximum width as infinite. So that way it can either become as small or as large as the page will allow it. I will come back and update the height in a moment, but before I do that, I'm going to need to add in some additional elements into it. And the next element I want to add into our drop area is our drag element. So this element is almost going to look like a group or a tile on our page, which is going to house all of the information for a particular link. And because this is a drag group, it's going to allow users to click on that and then drag it into a drop area that they would like. And then of course it's going to update the position of that within our database. And so I'm going to select to add in a drag drop group here. And the first thing I'll do is update the name of this. I'm going to call this drag drop link. And then from here I'm going to update the container layout to be a column because once again I'll be stacking elements in this vertically, so from top to bottom. I'm also then just going to jump to my appearance tab here and because I want this group to look like a tile on my page, I'm going to set the background style to be a flat color and I'm going to leave it as white. I'm then going to update the roundness of its borders to be 20 so that way it has some curved edges. And then I'll jump over into my layout tab here because I'd like to update the width settings. And similar to all of our existing elements, I want this group to be fully responsive regardless of the page size. So I'm going to like always unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. And later on, I'm going to come back and update the height. The only other thing I'd like to do though now is just add in some margin around this white group. And that margin is just going to ensure that I'll be able to actually see the drop area that this drag group sits within. So I'm just going to add in 10 pixels of margin at the top, 10 on the bottom, and then 30 on the left and 30 on the right. And now you'll see that my white group, which is going to act like a tile, sits within our drop area, which is that gray element. And we can easily identify where I could drag and drop this to. And now from here, I can add in all of the elements I want to display within each tile for a link. But before I do that, I'm just going to need to bring up my property editor here and head over to my appearance tab for our drag group. And I'm just going to need to update the type of content that I would like to display within this. And so because I'd like to display each individual link that a user has created within their database. I'm going to set the type of content to once again be a link and I'm going to want this white group here to reference the link that's stored in its parent group, which if you remember the parent group it sits within is the gray drop area, which the gray drop area is also pulling through the value of the repeating group link. So it's essentially just passing it down the chain to this particular white group here. And what that's going to allow me to do is add in things like the name of that link as well as the destination URL for that link too. And in order to display the information of each individual link, I'm going to add in a text element that's going to display things like the name and the URL of that link. So I'm going to scroll on down to my input forms here. And instead of just adding a regular text field within our visual elements, I'm actually going to add an input field. And the reason I'm doing that is because whenever someone clicks this button here, it's going to create a new link tile. But at that point in time, that link wouldn't have a name associated with it. And so a user is going to actually have to type in what the name is for that link. 
And so that's why I've selected an input form here because someone's actually gonna need to add an entry for what this particular link should be called. And so I'm gonna update the name of this to be called input title. And I'll also update the placeholder text here to be the word title, which of course the placeholder text is just going to be the temporary value that sits within this field until someone actually types in it. And later on, I'll be explaining how we can actually build out a workflow to update the title of the link itself whenever someone adds a value into this input field. But before I do that, I'm actually gonna to want to make some changes to the design of this particular input field. So at the moment, this actually does look like an input field. Whereas if you were to actually look at the real world link tree product, this section here doesn't look like a regular input field. It just looks like standard text because it doesn't have any borders or lines around it. And so what we're gonna do is choose to just update the style of this and remove all of those borders. And so I'm gonna select on my input element here. I'm gonna to choose to remove the style of this. And then I'm going to update, first of all, the font color of the text inside of this field. I'm gonna make it a darker shade of black. If you'd like this color code, it's 474747. I'm also gonna to choose to bold the text that's added into this. And then I'm going to scroll on down to our borders and I'm going to set the border value to be none. So that way there's no longer a border sitting around this particular input field. And then I'm also going to select on our input field one last time because I'd like to set the background style to also be none. So that way it's going to be completely transparent. And now this just looks like a standard text element, although it is in fact an input field, which means that a user can add a value into it. I'm also just going to jump over to our layout tab here because I'd like to update the height and width of this particular input field. What I'm gonna do is unselect that this should be a fixed width. Then I'm going to of course set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. So that way it can become as small or as large as it needs to be within our group here. And then when it comes to the actual height of this particular input field, I'm gonna leave this as a fixed value because I won't want it to expand any higher. Although I am gonna update the height here to be 35 pixels, just because I don't need as much empty space around the text that's gonna be added here. And then finally, I'm gonna add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left and 20 on the right, just to ensure that this input field doesn't touch the borders of my overall group element it sits within. And now after adding in this input field, I'm gonna to want to add another, which will store the URL of this particular link. And in order to streamline that whole process, I'm just gonna make a copy of this particular input field. Only this time I'm going to update the name of this to be called input URL. I'll also jump to our appearance tab and update the placeholder text to display the letters URL. And then the only other change I'll need to make is just within our layout tab here. I'm gonna to want to just remove the top margin because I'd like both of these input fields to sit directly on top of each other here. And now that we've finished adding our two input fields here that we need for each link, there's just one last section of elements I'd like to add into our overall link card here. And similar to the real world link tree product, I'd just like to add a series of icons that we're gonna use in order to add things like a thumbnail image, display a list of how many clicks this link has received, as well as a trash can icon to actually delete this link. And as you can see within this card here that is stacked vertically, so all of these elements sit on top of each other, the list of all the icons at the bottom are in fact stacked horizontally. So what I'm gonna need to do is add another group within my existing group and set its container layout to be a row so I can stack these side by side. So what I'm gonna do is jump back into my bubble editor here. I'm going to add yet another group within my existing drag group here. And I'm gonna update the name of this to be called group link icons. And as I mentioned, when it comes to this group, I'm gonna set the container layout to be a row so I can stack elements in this side by side. I'm then gonna to jump to my appearance tab and just remove the style of this just because I'd like to add a colored background. So I'm gonna set this to be a flat color and I might make this just a shade of green so I can actually see where it sits within our overall white group here. I'm then gonna to jump to my layout tab and the first thing I'd like to do is just update the width settings. So I'm gonna to want to make this fully responsive. So I will unselect that this should be a fixed width. I will set the minimum width to be zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite, which of course just means it'll be able to shrink or expand as much as it needs on my page. 
And then from here, I can start to add in all of my elements before I then come back and update the height and margin settings. And when it comes to the elements within this group, I'm going to scroll on up to our visual elements and I'm gonna add just an icon element in here. And I'm gonna search for the icon, which is a picture. So I'm just gonna type in the word picture and I'll select this first icon here, which just looks like a picture photo. And the purpose of this icon is to later on build out a feature that when clicked would allow someone to upload a custom thumbnail image they would like for this particular link. But before I do that, I'm gonna to choose to just edit the style of this icon here. And I'm just going to update the icon color to be a shade of black or gray that I have here. If you'd like that color code, it's 545454. And the reason why I've selected to edit the overall style of this icon, not just remove the style and add in a one-off value, is just because I'm gonna reference the color of this icon multiple times throughout my build today. So instead of having to remove the style each individual time and add in the exact same color, I'm just gonna edit the overall saved style here for our standard icon. And then I'm going to reference its color every single time we add an icon into our application. From here though, I'm gonna to jump to my layout tab because I just like to update the size of this icon. As you can see, it's quite big at this point in time. And then when it comes to this icon, I'm going to set the width here to be 30 pixels and the height here to be 30 pixels. And I'm gonna leave both of these as fixed values because I don't want this icon to expand or contract based on the size of the page. I'm always gonna want it to be 30 pixels by 30 pixels. I'm also gonna update the vertical alignment of this icon to position it in the center of my green group here, which is just going to ensure that regardless of the page size or the dimensions, it's always gonna be aligned in the center with the additional elements I'm about to add in. And the next element I'd actually like to add is going to be the count of clicks that this particular link has received. And before I display that count, similar to the real world link tree product, I'd like to add an icon in front of this, which is kind of just like a little bar chart. And instead of actually adding an icon and then another text element, a little hack that I have is I'm gonna show you a way to actually add the icon inside of your text element. So if I was to just add a text element into my green group here, what we can do is use a little bit of HTML in order to display our bar chart in front of this text element directly next to our text itself. And in order to do that, we're going to add in a open square bracket followed by the two letters F, A, and then a closed square bracket. So this is just the markup for HTML in order to add in an icon. Then after this closed bracket, I'm going to add in the actual name of the icon I'd like to display, which in this case is just going to be bar dash chart. Then from here, I'm just gonna to need to close off this formatting. So I'm gonna add in yet another open bracket here, followed by a forward slash, the letters FA and then a close bracket. And what you'll now see is that that's actually going to reformat as a little bar chart icon. So if you ever want to add in an icon within a text element, that's exactly how you can do it. Beside this icon though, what I'm gonna do is display the total number of clicks that this particular link has received. And because we're storing that value within our database, I can easily choose to insert dynamic data and then display the parent groups thing, which I haven't yet set at this point in time. So because this text element sits within our green group here, if I was to update the green groups type of content to be a link, I can have it fetch the same link data from the white group that it sits within. So I'm just gonna be passing that along the chain yet again. So I'm gonna set the data source of our green group to be the parent groups link. So that is the white group that it sits within, which of course is fetching it from our drop area, which is fetching it from our repeating group. I know that's a lot to comprehend, but essentially it's kind of just like one of those Russian dolls where essentially within each layer, it's all connected. Then I'm gonna click on my text element again. And what you'll see is that we now have the option to reference the parent groups link and in this case, I'd like to display the number of clicks, which is a number stored in our database. So if there is two clicks, it's gonna say the number two clicks. If there's a thousand, it'll display the number 1000. What I will just need to do is actually add in a space here and type in the word clicks. So this field here is just going to display a number. So I'm gonna to need to write the text there. And one other thing I'm gonna to need to factor in is the very likely scenario 
where a link has zero clicks. So whenever a link is created, it's of course gonna start with zero clicks. If the link itself in our database has zero clicks stored on it, it's just going to have an empty value. It's not going to display the number zero. And so what I need to do is create a condition on this text element that just recognizes if a link has zero clicks, in which case I would like to just display the number zero followed by the word clicks. So I'm gonna to head to my condition tab here and I'm gonna define a new condition that just recognizes if the parent group's link, so that is the link that's being passed on from our initial repeating group, if it's count of clicks is empty. So if I scroll right on down, we'll see the option here to select is empty. So if the number of link clicks is empty, meaning it has no value, I'm going to update the text that's displayed here, in which case I'd just like to display the same chart icon followed by the number zero, which I'm gonna manually write in, and then the word clicks. And so I'm just gonna whiz through and add in the HTML formatting again for my bar chart here. If you wanted, you could just choose to copy and paste this across from the appearance tab here if you'd like. I've just remembered it, so I'm just gonna add it in. I'm gonna type in the number zero manually, followed by the word clicks. And if we want, we can toggle this on and off to see what that's actually going to look like when this condition is true. And if we hadn't added this in, this would actually just be a blank field. So it'd be a bar chart followed by the word clicks. Whereas now if there are no clicks, it's going to actually display the number zero followed by the word clicks. And that's everything we'll need to add there. What I'd like to do from here though, is just update the responsive settings of this particular text element. So I'm gonna to head to my layout tab here. I'm gonna start by vertically aligning this element in the center of my green group. And what you'll now see is that it's always going to be positioned in line with my existing icon that I've added in. I'm going to then unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm gonna set the minimum width to zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. But one thing I'm just gonna point out is that because we're only gonna be displaying a small count of numbers, we actually don't need all of this space for this particular text element. And so what I'm actually gonna do is select this option here to fit the width of this element to the content within it. And what you'll now see is that the width will automatically just shrink and cut off whenever this particular text ends. So if it only displayed a number and then a word, it would cut off here. If it displayed a long sentence for some reason, it would expand all the way out. And then from here, I'm just gonna update the height to be zero. So that way it collapses around the text as well. And now you'll see it's perfectly centered with our icon element beside it there. And then the very last thing I'll need to do is just add in 10 pixels of margin on the left, just so that way this text doesn't sit directly beside our icon. And then finally from here, I'm just gonna add in one last icon on the right hand side, which is just going to be a little trash can, which when clicked later on, we're gonna build out a way to delete this link. So in order to streamline that process, I'm actually just gonna make a copy of our existing picture icon here. I'll just drag this across. I'm gonna head over to my appearance tab and I'm just going to search for a trash can icon here. And I won't need to update any of the styling because I'm already happy with the color of this icon. The only thing I will need to do though is just jump over to my layout tab and add in 10 pixels of margin on the left here, just so that way this icon doesn't touch our text element beside it. And that's everything I'm gonna to want to add into my little bottom menu here. So from here, I'm gonna click on my green group that they sit within. I'm then going to update the height here. And so because we have this option selected here to fit the height of this element to the content within it, I'm gonna set the minimum height to be zero and that will collapse nicely around all of the elements inside it there. And then finally, I'd also like to add in some margin around this particular group. So I'm gonna add in 10 pixels of margin at the top 10 on the bottom, and then also 30 pixels of margin on the left and 30 pixels of margin on the right here. And that actually concludes everything I'd like to add into our overall link tile here. So what I'm gonna do is select on the white group that we have, and now I can update its height. So I'm gonna set the height to be zero, and because we have this option selected to fit the height of this element to the content within it, it's going to collapse nicely around all of the groups there. And then finally, I'm gonna select on the drop area that sits within our repeating group because I can now update its height as well. So similar to just before, we have the option selected here to fit the height of this element to the content within it. So that just means that if I set the minimum height to be zero, it's going to collapse nicely around the actual white group here. And as you can see, we can start to see our tiles come together within our homepage. 
So I know it was a little hard to visualize when they were so big before, but what you'll see is that these are going to just be a small little number of tiles later on in our build. But now from here, the very last thing I'd like to do within this section of our tutorial is add in the third section of our homepage, which if you remember in the real world Linktree product, is going to display a preview of what a user's Linktree profile will look like. So at the top, you can see that they display their own Linktree profile link, and then they display almost like a little phone preview here. That's definitely something we can replicate within our own build. So what we're gonna do is we're going to add in another group section on our page within our red group here. So our red group is the group where the container layout is a row and we're storing our two existing groups within it. What I'm gonna do is add a third group into this. And what you'll now see is that because we have another group within our existing red group, the second group that we'd added in is going to collapse, which makes these look more like realistic tiles, similar to the real world Linktree product. I'm then just gonna move our new group to the next position in our overall red group. So that way it becomes the third section of our page. And I'm going to update the name of this group to be called group link preview, because of course this is where we're going to display the preview of not only the user's URL, but also a preview of their link page. From here, I'm going to set the container layout to be a column because I'll be stacking elements in this from top to bottom. I'll also choose to just update the width settings for now as well. And in this instance, I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. And like always, I'm gonna set the minimum width to be zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite, so that way it becomes fully responsive. I'll also jump over to my appearance tab here, remove the style of this group, and set a solid background color, because I'd like this to be a specific darker shade of gray that I have, which if you'd like that color code is F7, F7, F7. And now within this particular group, as I just shown you, I'm gonna add in two different sections. There's going to be the almost like the header menu, which displays the person's actual link tree profile link. And then below that, I'm going to add in just a mobile phone preview. And so for that first section, what we're going to do is actually display two elements side by side. There's going to be a text element here as well as a button. And so because we want to display two elements horizontally, we're going to need to once again add another group within our existing group here. And that group is of course going to have the container layout of a row, not a column. So I'm gonna add in yet a, another group here and I'm going to update the name of this to be called group link preview text. And when it comes to this group, I'm going to remove the style of this, give it a flat background color and I'm gonna keep that as white. I'll then jump to my layout tab because the first thing I'll need to do is update the container layout to be a row, because as I mentioned, they're gonna be placing two elements in here side by side. So they're gonna to need to be positioned horizontally. I'll then choose to unselect that this should be a fixed width. Like always, I'm gonna set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. So that way this group is fully responsive at all times. And then from here, I'm gonna add my two elements into it. So the first element was just a text element that displayed a user's profile link. And so what I'm gonna do is choose to add a text element into our group here. And then within this text element, I'm just gonna start by adding in some static text here that displays the words, my link tree with a semicolon. And then what I'm gonna to wanna to do is actually display the link of a user's profile. And now you might remember when we had registered a user's account within our platform, we'd taken the time to set a slug for a user's profile. And of course, I'm not talking about the kind of slimy slug you might be thinking of, but as you remember, I'd pointed out that a slug is just a unique URL string, which can be assigned to an individual within our platform. And so what I'm gonna to wanna to do here is actually insert the link of our Linktree website. So let's say our domain was linktree.com. What I'd like to do is insert that link and then add the slug to a user's profile. So that way, if they were to copy this link here, it would redirect them directly to their own profile page. And so in order to do that, what I'm gonna do is insert dynamic data here. And I'm gonna type in the word URL. 
And the first thing I'll need to do is actually insert our root domain. So this is the core part of our domain. So if for instance, we were using a Linktree clone, linktree.com would be our root domain and anything after that first forward slash is an extension on that. So I'm going to insert our home URL, which would be our linktree.com or whatever your own unique domain is. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose to add in the word profile because this is going to be the name of the page that we're going to create in a moment. And one thing you might have noticed is that at this point in time, if we were displaying our own domain here under our website home URL, so linktree.com, you might see that I just have the word profile directly next to it. So I don't actually have a forward slash splitting these up. And that's just because in Bubble, it's going to add a forward slash by default at the end of our home URL here. And so I think the best way to actually illustrate this is just by previewing this page here, just so I can show you how this is going to look. So over on my link here, as you can see, nothing's completely responsive at this point in time. But what you might see is that we have the domain of our home URL. And then at the end of that, it's automatically applied a forward slash followed by the word profile. And this matches the same domain that we have up in our URL bar here. So this is the core domain of my application while it's in development mode inside of Bubble. And so I just wanted to take the time to illustrate that we won't need to add a forward slash there. But what I'll need to do from here is then add an extension onto my URL, which adds the unique slug for each user's profile. So if this is gonna send someone through to the profile page, which we're going to create in a moment in our tutorial, what I'd like to do is also send it through the value of someone's unique slug. So on that profile page, we know whose profile information to display. And so in order to do this, I'm going to jump back into my bubble editor. At the end of my word profile here, I'm going to add in that forward slash. Then I'm going to insert dynamic data again and display the current user. So that is the person who is logged in and is going to be adding links to their profile. I'd like to display their slug, which is their unique URL, which is essentially going to be their username. And in this case, it's going to display their full URL, which they can highlight and copy. What I'm also going to do with this text is choose to open up our rich text editor here, which will allow us to edit sections of this text. And I'm just going to highlight the bit of static text here that displays the words, my link tree. I'll choose to bold the formatting here, then save this. So now you'll see that really stands out. Then after updating all of this text, I'm going to jump over to my layout tab because of course I'd like to make this text field here responsive. The first thing I'm going to do is vertically align this in the center of my white group. So that way when I add a button into this, I can make sure they're horizontally aligned directly next to each other. I'm then going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. Like always, I'll be setting the minimum width to zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite, which is just going to ensure that this element takes up as much space as it can while remaining fully responsive, regardless of the browser's size. I'll then set the minimum height as zero, so that way it collapses around all of the text inside of it there. And then finally, I'm going to add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 10 on the bottom and 20 on the left here. And then the very last element I'll need to add within our white group is just a button, which is going to essentially allow someone to copy the link of their Linktree profile to their clipboard. So I'm gonna to select to add a button element in here. And I'm gonna have this button display the word share. Then when it comes to the styling of this button, I'm gonna create a one-off style that I'm gonna be using just here. So I'm gonna to choose to remove this style. I'm going to update the font color of the text to be a darker shade of black, which if you'd like that color code, it is 5E, 5E, 5E. I'm then gonna to want to update the background color of this button to be white. And then finally, I'd like to add a solid border around this particular button. And to be honest, I'm quite happy to leave the color of the border as is. It's just like a light shade of blue. I will though jump over into my layout tab here because I'd like to vertically align this button in the center of my group. And then I'm gonna to want to move this button to the right hand side of my group. So I'm gonna move this to the next position. And then when it comes to the width of this button, I'm gonna set the width to be 100 pixels. And I will in fact be keeping this as a fixed width because I'm only ever gonna want this button to be 100 pixels at all given times. I don't want it to expand or contract. 
I'm happy with the height being 45, but one thing I would like to do is just add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 10 on the bottom, 20 on the left, and also 20 on the right. And that's just going to ensure that this button doesn't touch any of the surrounding elements around it there. From here, I can then click on my white group that these elements sit within. I can then scroll on down to my height settings here and choose to update the minimum height to be zero. And because we have this option selected here to fit the height of the group to the content within it, it's going to collapse nicely around all of these elements here. And now finally, the very last thing I want to add onto this page is just going to be that mobile preview that we'd seen within the Linktree homepage. So this just shows someone a preview of their profile without having to actually go and view that profile. And in order to create that preview today, we're going to almost create like a little mock-up of a mobile phone. And the way I'm gonna do that is by using yet another group. So within our gray group here, I'm going to add a, another group. And I'm gonna make this look like a mobile device. And then later on in our build, I'm going to add in all of the user's links inside of this mobile device. But when it comes to this group, I'm gonna jump over to my appearance tab here. I'm just gonna to choose to remove the style of this because I'd like to give it a flat background color here. And when it comes to the color of this background, I just have a gray color code I'm gonna paste in here. If you'd like that, it's ED, ED, ED. I'm then going to add a solid border around this particular group. And I'm gonna update the width of this border to be five. I'm also gonna set the roundness of the borders to be 20. And then I'm quite happy to leave the color of the border as is. But what we'll need to do is make this look more like an actual mobile device. So we're going to jump over to our layout tab here. And the first thing we'll need to do is just update our container layout to be a column. Because when I display a list of a user's links that are stored on their profile, I want to stack these vertically, so from top to bottom. But from here, I'm then going to scroll on down to our horizontal alignment, which will just update the position of where this group sits within our existing group here. So I'm gonna set the horizontal alignment to be in the center, so that way it's always in the center of this group. When it comes to the width, I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm gonna set a minimum width of zero here, but then I am in fact going to add a maximum width of 300 pixels. And now the reason why I've selected a maximum width of 300 pixels is because this is roughly the dimensions of a mobile device here. So I want the width to be no larger than this at all times. Although because the minimum width is set as zero, this means that this group will contract if needed. But when the page is larger than that, it's only ever going to be 300 pixels at max. And then from here, when it comes to the height, I'm gonna set the minimum height to be 500 pixels, which means that at minimum, this phone here will be this height and these dimensions, which you can see actually looks like a mobile device now. However, if a user was to have, let's say 20 links on their profile, and we wanted to display a preview of all of those links in our mobile device, because I have an infinite max height here, it will just continually expand down and add those in. The very last thing I'll need to do though is just add in some margins around this particular phone element. And so I'm gonna add in 20 pixels of margin at the top. I won't add any on the bottom, but I'll add in 50 pixels of margin on the left and 50 pixels of margin on the right just so that way when the page contracts here, as you'll see, the phone will never touch the borders of our overall page. Instead, it will just continually shrink in size there, which is all a part of the responsive experience we're gonna to create today. And at this point in our tutorial, that's all I'm gonna add onto our phone here. I am gonna have a dedicated section that covers how we can actually display all of the user's links. But at this point, I feel like I've overwhelmed us with how much was included in this home page. At this point, we still haven't covered how we can actually add a link into a user's profile, as well as, of course, rearrange all of our links and the order of them, and then from there, actually display a preview of a user's profile. But at this point in time, what I wanted to do is just show you a quick preview of our homepage now that we've finished adding in all of our three sections. So if I was to refresh my preview over here, what you'll see is that we have our three different sections put together. Obviously in our middle section here, we don't currently have any links to display. So this whole section is going to be blank. And I know that it kind of looks like a big rainbow cake at the moment. And that's just because I've color coded all of my individual groups here. Of course, if you wanted to preview or publish your app, you could update the color to be white or even transparent. But there's still so much I want to add onto our homepage. So I've just left these here for now so we can see where everything sits. 
But in general, you can start to see our page coming together quite nicely. And in all honesty, in comparison to some of my previous products that I built, I found that there was a ton of things that we had to add onto this particular homepage, just because there's so many different groups as well as the draggable elements, which we haven't yet even touched. So if you've made it this far, I think you're doing very well within our tutorial. What I wanna do though, is just jump back into my Notion checklist and tick off that we have finished building out all of the three individual sections of our homepage. And this will help us keep up to speed with where we are throughout our build. After building out the core of our homepage, the next core feature I wanted to focus on here is being able to actually create a new Linktree profile link in someone's account, as well as also be able to edit the details of an existing link. So let's say someone wants to update the title of a link or even the destination URL. This is an experience that we're gonna create within this module. And thankfully, because we've already taken the time to build out most of the homepage, this is actually going to be a relatively straightforward process. So what we're gonna do is jump over into our bubble editor here, and we're gonna open up our index page, which is our homepage that we had previously built. And the very first thing I wanna do is build out the workflow to actually create a new link within our database. And of course, once someone creates that link, I'll have that be displayed within our repeating group of links. So within our little tiles here. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna click on the add a new link button. We're gonna choose to start a brand new workflow whenever this element is clicked. And within this workflow, it's relatively straightforward. We're just gonna add in one step. And within this step, we're gonna head to our data tab because I'd like to select to create a new thing. Now the type of thing I'd like to create is going to be a new link. And at this point, it would in fact create a new link for someone and display it within our repeating group of links here. But there's also one minor little tweak that I wanna to add to the process of creating our link. And that is that I just like to update the position of where that link is going to be displayed within our repeating group. So if you remember, if I click on our overall repeating group here, and open up its data source here where we were performing a search for all of the links created by the current user. So the person logged into their own Linktree account. You might remember that we were sorting these by the position number of the link. So each link will be allocated a particular number. And in this case, I'll want the link with the position number one to be placed at the top, the link with position number two to be placed in the second position. And then there'll be three, four, five, six, and so on. And so what I just wanna do is whenever I create a new link, I'm just going to want to identify how many links currently sit within our repeating group. And then I'm going to add a position number that's relevant to where this new link should sit. And in this case, I'd like the new link to go straight to the bottom. And then later on, we'll be building out a feature that allows someone to rearrange all of these links here. And so in that case, we'll be able to update their position number but by default, I just want any new link to go to the bottom of our repeating group. And this is an experience that we can easily create. So I'm just gonna jump back into my workflow tab here. And where we've created a new link, I'm just gonna choose to update one of the data fields within this new link that we're creating. And that data field is going to be its position number. And in this case, what I'd like to do is, as I mentioned, add this link to the bottom of the list. And so in order to do that, I'm going to perform a search through our database and recognize how many links have already been created by this particular person. So if you were logged into your own Linktree account and you've already created two links, what I'd like to do is perform a count on how many links you've created. So there'll be two. And then I'd like to update the position number to be the amount of the current links, so two. And then I'd just like to add to it another number. So it'll be two plus one which means that its position number would now become three. And it'll work out the exact same if you've got, let's say four, six, or even 10 links already created. And so the way I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna have the new link, its position number equal, and then I'm going to perform a search in my database for all of the links that were created by the current user. So created by equals the current user. And then I'll want to perform a count on how many links have already been created by the current user. So to my example before, if someone's already created two links, the count of those links will be two. 
And what I'd like to do is set the position number to be that number plus the number one. So I'm just gonna manually type that in. And so now this will ensure that any new link that is created will be positioned at the bottom of our repeating group. And what I'd love to do is actually just show you an example of how this is going to function. So I'm quickly just going to run a preview of my app here. And within my preview, I'll select that I'd like to add a new link into my repeating group here. And what you'll see is that it's created a new link tile here. And thankfully, this is also a relatively straightforward process. So if we were to just jump back into our bubble editor here, what I'd like to do is create a workflow that recognizes when a value of either our title or URL input fields have been changed. So by default, these values are blank, but if someone was to actually type in a title for a link, I'd just like to update the value of this specific link within our repeating group. And the same goes for our URL field here. And so the way I can actually create these workflows is by jumping into my workflow editor. I'm going to create a brand new workflow from scratch here. And if I head to my elements triggers, I'm gonna create a workflow that's triggered every single time an input's value is changed. And now from here, I can select which particular input field I'd like to reference. And in this case, I want it to be the input title field. So whenever someone adds a title into their particular link, I'd like to run this workflow. And this workflow is incredibly simple to build. The only thing I'd like to do within this is head to our data tab. And in this case, we'll want to make changes to an existing thing. We're not gonna create a new thing because we've already created our link. In this case, because that link already exists, I just wanna make changes to it. And of course, the change I wanna make is to the title field of that link. So I'm gonna to choose to make changes to a thing. And so the thing I would like to change is going to be the parent group's link. So the parent group refers to the actual white tile that our input field sits within. And if you remember, with all of our groups that sit inside of our repeating group, we're passing the data on through each layer. So that way we can reference it within our input field here. So within our workflow, we're gonna to want to change the parent group's link. And the field I'd like to change is just going to be the title field. What I'd also just like to do is select on the workflow trigger here. And just so I can tell this workflow apart from all of my others, what I'm gonna do is just update the event color of this to be blue. Just so that way, whenever I see a blue workflow on my homepage, I know that we're updating the value of an input field. And just like that, that's how we can update the value of the title for each link. But of course, we're gonna to need to replicate the same process for our URL. So what I'm gonna do is jump to my workflow editor once again. I'll create a new workflow from scratch. I'll once again select from our element triggers and choose the event that triggers every single time an input's value is changed. Only this time, the input element will be our input URL field. I'm also gonna update its event color to be blue. So that way I can identify these two workflows from my other existing workflows. And then within this workflow, I'm gonna do very much the same process as before. I'm gonna head to my data tab. I'm gonna to choose to make changes to a thing. The thing I'd like to change is once again, the parent groups link. And in this case, I'd like to update the URL data field and I'll be setting the value of this to be the input URL that sits within our page. And now that is how we can edit the details of an existing link. So let's say someone's taken the time to add in a value to both the title and the URL field. At this point in time, those values would be updated in our database, but they would not yet be displayed within our input fields. So within our two fields here, we have some placeholder text, which if you remember, Placeholder text is used to temporarily display a value until the user actually clicks into this input field, in which case this text would then disappear. But if someone's already taken the time to update the value of this link, I'll want to display that permanently within this field. And that's where our initial content field comes into play. So unlike placeholder text, initial content allows you to permanently store a value within an input field. And in this case, what I'd like to do is insert dynamic data and display the parent group's link, its title. So that way, if this link does have a title stored in our database, it will display it within this field. And if it doesn't, it's just going to revert back and display our placeholder text. Then I'll wanna do the same thing for our URL here. So I'm going to insert dynamic data into our initial content, and I'm going to display the parent group's link, the URL field here. And that is exactly how we can choose to not only edit the details of an existing link, but also display the values that we've stored in our database.
Before I take another preview of this page now, there is one last thing I'd like to update, and that is that I can see under my repeating group here. There's quite a bit of empty space that's being displayed. So my repeating group sits within this blue group here, if you remember. And so what I'm gonna do is just jump back into my bubble editor here. I'm going to click on my repeating group, and I'm gonna jump to my layout tab. And it's at this point that I'm finally gonna update the height of my repeating group. So because we have this option selected to fit the height of this element to the content within it, this means that after I've finished adding in all of my elements into my repeating group, I can set the minimum height to be zero, and it will collapse around any elements that have been added into each cell. I'm then going to click on the blue group that our repeating group sits within. And I'm going to also set its minimum height to be zero, so that way it collapses nicely around it as well. And now if I was to go and refresh my page here, not only will you see that our blue group now collapses nicely around our overall repeating group, but I can actually start to add in the details of my very first link. So I'm gonna call this link my Instagram link. And in this case, I'm just gonna add a URL. I'm gonna say www.instagram.com forward slash test account. And if I was to click away here and then refresh my page, what you'll see is that because the values of this link have been updated in our database and we're displaying that initial content, this link has not only saved, but is also still displaying the exact same values. From here, if I wanted to add another link, I could choose to click our button. It would add one into our repeating group. And because we're updating the position number of every new link that is created, this new link will be positioned at the bottom of our repeating group. And in this case, I could update this to display that this is a TikTok link. I could say that the link is www.tiktok.com forward slash test account. And once again, if I was to refresh my page, what you'll see is that these values will remain consistent. And it's really at this point in time that you can start to see our Linktree product come together. We're still yet to build out the feature that actually allows us to reorder these links within our repeating group, as well as display a preview of someone's profile within our little mobile device here. But at this point in time, we're making great progress through our build, so I'm quite happy with how it's coming together. If I jump back into my Notion checklist, I'm going to tick off that we've finished building out the feature to create and edit a link. And throughout that process, I also explained how we could update the initial content of a link. So that way we could display the relevant data stored within our database into the relevant field on our page. At this point in our tutorial, that is all I have time to include within this video. As you can see, we've been building for hours and there's still so many features we're yet to uncover. At this point, we're still yet to create the feature that allows us to rearrange links, as well as add a thumbnail image to links, then even create the user's public Linktree profile, followed by a suite of paid membership features that allow users to customize the theme of their profile. If you wanted to get access to the full course, I'd recommend hitting the link in the description so you can purchase this from my website. I'm confident that it's gonna save you months having to learn how to build the rest of this application, and it'll help you launch your own startup or app in a fraction of the time. For now though, I just wanted to say a massive thank you for taking the time to watch up to this point in our tutorial. And of course, if you ever wanted to stay up to date with any additional Bubble tutorials I post, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you can be the first to know when I post new videos. 